Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Ruskies and Reads. Today I wanted to do a quick fun little video where I go through and see what the best books I've ever read are according to Goodreads. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the shelf on Goodreads that has all of the books that I've ever read and I'm going to sort them by average rating starting from the highest and moving downwards and we're going to go through the top 10 books that I've ever read according to Goodreads. Now I am going to eliminate Harry Potter from this because I can already see that it takes up like half of all of these books. We're going to go ahead and talk about the top 10 other books on this list. I just thought it would be fun because I recently read the lowest books that were on my TBR. Now those are probably not necessarily the worst books I've ever read according to Goodreads but it did get me interested to see what books I've read are the highest rated according to Goodreads. So let's go ahead and see what it says. So coming in at a 4.62 rating, A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J Mass. These are limited edition book covers that I purchased uh, a couple of years ago now I think. I just think that they are stunning. Um, so we have Reese and Vera on the cover. I'm sure that you've heard of this series but the very first book A Court of Thorns and Roses is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It follows our main character Feyre and one day she is out hunting for her family and she kills a wolf that ends up having been a fairy and so as punishment she is taken into the fairy world and she is forced to live in the spring court with Tamlin and it kind of goes from there. She's learning about the fairy realm and she's learning to kind of fall for Tamlin. This is the second book in the series. It is definitely the most well-loved book in the series. It is definitely well deserved that rating. This takes the series in an entirely new direction and it really ramps it up. So if you have read A Court of Thorns and Roses and you don't really feel like it's your thing, if you enjoyed it enough I would recommend continuing. If you hated it I wouldn't necessarily recommend continuing because there's nothing to say that you wouldn't hate this as well. But I think if you enjoyed the story of Akatar enough to go ahead and continue I would recommend because this is another league. It's another world really and like I said it takes the story in a completely different direction. It is definitely chonky. You get to meet some of the best and most fantastic characters in here and I am not surprised that this is number one on the highest rated books that I've ever read. And I don't think I said but A Court of Mist and Fury had over 800,000 ratings so not too bad. So number two at 4.61 with just under 500,000 ratings is Cricket Kingdom by Leigh Bardugo. This is the second book in the Six of Crows duology. I don't really want to say much about this story just because of course it is a continuation of book one but these books are young adult fantasy. In book one you are following the Dregs which is a group headed by Kaz Brecker and they are called the Dregs because they are kind of considered the dregs of society and in book one you see them pulling off an epic heist. I absolutely loved Six of Crows. I love the dregs. I love the characters. You fall in love with them and then of course you get to see more of them in Crooked Kingdom as well. I think I enjoyed Crooked Kingdom just a bit more than Six of Crows but overall they are both very very well done. If you have watched Shadow and Bone on Netflix so that is an adaptation of both Leah Bardugo's Grisha trilogy as well as this duology so it actually introduces you to these characters in that series but it's very very different because this duology is set many years after the Grisha verse trilogy so they are really not connected there is really no crossovers in characters so the Netflix adaptation is very very different but if you have already watched it and you haven't read this duology you have already been introduced to the characters so you can kind of get a bit of an idea of what you might expect from this but it is definitely action-packed high stakes high risk morally great characters who are absolutely fantastic and you just can't help but love Kaz Dirty Hands Brecker. So this is another series that I highly recommend and I'm not at all surprised that it is number two on the highest rated books that I've ever read. Coming in at number three with a 4.60 rating and over 1 million individual ratings, The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. Y'all know Kristen Hanna is one of my favorite authors of all time. I sing her praises to the highest any single time I talk about one of her books. She is just one of the most masterful character driven writers I have ever read. She really brings her characters to life and The Nightingale is probably one of the best World War II historical fictions that I've ever read. And breathtaking is really the only word that I can use to describe this book. I was literally forgetting to breathe as tears were streaming down my cheeks as I finished this story. It was just so remarkably beautiful. So this is a World War II historical fiction but it is ultimately a story about sisters, two sisters in France during World War II who take very different 
past during the war and who react to the war differently, both doing what they feel is right and what they feel like they must do to survive. One of the sisters, Vianne, at the start of World War II is a housewife with a young daughter, but when her husband, Antoine, is called to the front to fight in the war, Vianne is kind of left on her own to raise their daughter, Sophie. And during this book, she finds herself having to make decisions she never thought she would to be able to protect her child. Isabel, on the other hand, is Vianne's very stubborn and impetuous sister. She's definitely the more rebellious type and you can see that in this book as she decides to join the French resistance to thwart Nazi endeavors. I can't express enough what a talented author Kristen Hanna is. It's not simply in the way that she writes or in her ability to create very atmospheric and vivid scenes through her books, but it's the complexity and the depth that she gives her characters, the way that she brings them to life so thoroughly. And I really found this story to be easily accessible. So if you are not typically a historical fiction reader or even a World War II historical fiction reader, I'm still going to recommend this book to you because, like I said, it is ultimately a story about sisters and the choices that they make during the war that sets them on very different paths. They both end up having to make tough decisions that they never thought that they would have to make during their lifetime. And it's just so poignant and harrowing and heartbreaking and touching. It has a little bit of everything that you would expect to see there's romance, there's danger, there's intrigue, there's resistance, action. So if you are possibly looking into getting into historical fiction and you're trying to find a way to start, I would recommend this because like I said, I feel like it's very accessible and Kristen Hanna just has a way of bringing the time, the place, the characters to life to make you feel like you are there and you just connect to the story and these characters so thoroughly and you love them and you root for them and you care for them. And I cannot recommend this book enough. So this is another one that I'm not surprised is so highly rated and at over a million ratings, it's still holding strong at a 4.60. And so you know they can't be wrong. So number four on this list, that is Empire of Storms by Sarah J. Mass. This is the fifth book in her Throne of Glass series, so I definitely can't speak to the details of the story, but this is definitely one of my favorites in the series so far. If you're not familiar with the Throne of Glass series, it starts when you're meeting Selena Sardothian. She is an assassin who has been enslaved in the salt mines of Endovier. When she is approached by the prince who is asking her to be in this battle to see who is the best to become the king's assassin. So you're seeing her as she is released from the salt mines, she is rescued and she is taken to the capital where she's going to fight for the king in an effort to become his champion and his assassin. And it really just goes from there. In a similar vein to the A Court of Thorns and Roses series, this series really, really takes a turn. Only in this series, it really starts at about book three. So in book one, you're following the trials that she is going through. In book two, you're seeing kind of what happens afterwards. And by the end of book two, several things are revealed that really propel the story forward and it really changes by book three. And then of course, by book five, you're in it, you're in love with the characters, you're following the journey, you're waiting to see what happens. This definitely ends on a cliffhanger. This is definitely one of my favorites in that series so far. This one has just been going for so long and I feel like you really get to see a lot of the characters and their growth and development and so much happens. And Selena is just such a badass character. I love her. So this is just such a strong series. I feel like this would probably be the one that I recommend if you are interested in getting into Sarah J Mass at all. Number five for this video is going to actually be Queen of Shadows, which is number four in the Throne of Glass series. This has about 424,000 ratings and it sits at a 4.57, so it is definitely up there. This and Empire of Storms are definitely the two strongest books in the series so far. Obviously, I still have two more to go and the seventh and final book could definitely beat those out, but I definitely love this. You can see um, our girl Manon here on the cover, which is absolutely stunning. Again, these are custom covers that I ordered, I believe, from Nerdy Ink. I don't know if they are still available, but if they are, I will try to remember to link them down below for you. But Sarah J Mass is also dominating this list as well. At number six for this video, we have Reminders of Him by Colleen Hoover, which I'm thrilled to see on here. It has a rating of 4.50 with just over 600,000 ratings. This is definitely one of my top books of the year and possibly one of my favorite Colleen Hoovers of all time. She is definitely one of my favorite authors. I love basically everything that I read by her, but there was something so beautiful and raw about this story that really put it in a league above, in my opinion. This follows our main character, Kenna, and five years prior to the start of the story, Kenna made 
made a devastating mistake that ended up leading to the death of the man she loved named Scotty. And she has actually been serving a prison sentence for the past several years. She has now recently been released and she is headed back to the town where all of this happened because she wants to develop a relationship with her daughter, Diem. She found out she was pregnant while all of this was happening and she ended up giving custody of Diem to Scotty's parents. And now that she's out, she wants to go meet Diem and have a relationship with her, but she knows that's going to be extremely difficult to do. One of the first people she connects with in town is Ledger Ward, who is a local bar owner and who had a connection to Scotty and now has a deep relationship with Diem. And once Ledger Ward kind of finds out who she is, he is very upset. He hates her. He wants nothing to do with her. But the more that he gets to know her, the more that he's seeing another side to all of this and the more that he is realizing that Diem could only benefit from having her mother in her life. And it puts him in a really tough spot because he's trying to be loyal to Scotty's parents and to Scotty. But at the same time, he's thinking of Diem and he gets to know Kenna and knows that she's not a bad person and that she just really wants to be in her daughter's life. So it's about Kenna and her daughter. It's about Kenna and Ledger. It's about Kenna and Scotty's parents and Scotty and all of it. For Kenna, this is a story of redemption and absolution. For Ledger and Scotty's parents, it's really a journey of forgiveness. There's just so much beauty going on in this story. Like I said, it was just so raw and it was a little bit harrowing and it was definitely a little bit more hard hitting than I was expecting it to be. So this was a, such a solid, solid book by Colleen Hoover and I'm not surprised at all to see it in the top 10 of books that I've ever read. Then at number seven, sitting at a 4.49 with just over 724,000 ratings is Six of Crows by Lee Bardigo. So Crooked Kingdom beats it out in terms of ratings, but I have already mentioned this. This follows Kaz Brecker and the dregs and their heist and all of the mischief and hijinks that ensue. I actually enjoyed these more than the original Grisha trilogy and you definitely don't need to read the Grisha trilogy to enjoy these at all. So you can just dive right into this duology if you are interested. With 327,000 ratings sitting at 4.48, I am sure nobody is going to be surprised to see House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass. You can see that I tabbed the heck out of this. This is Sarah J. Mass's first foray into adult fantasy, and I think that she did such a great job. I felt like this world was very complex and well-developed. There was so many amazing characters in here. I absolutely loved Bryce. I absolutely loved Hunt. And I'm so excited to be diving into House of Sky and Breath at some time in 2023. I definitely want to continue and be caught up in this series by the time the next book in the series is released. So if you're not familiar, this follows our main character, Bryce Quinlan. And at the time of this story, she is basically living the good life. She works hard all day at this kind of art gallery type situation that, that has kind of like magical artifacts. And at night, she's just partying, having a lot of fun. But then one day, her best friend Danica, who is a werewolf, and Danica's pack are all brutally killed. And it kind of sends Bryce into a tailspin. And about a year later, similar murders are happening. And so Bryce has been tasked by the archangel Micah to kind of help solve what is going on because she had such a close connection to Danica. She, Micah thinks that she might be able to help. But in order to assist Bryce with her investigation, or at the very least, keep an eye on her, Micah has sent Hunt Avalar. Hunt is a fallen angel who won rebelled against Micah and the current regime and Micah now uses him basically as his own personal assassin and so you're following Bryce as she's trying to figure out the truth about what happened to Danica and what is happening currently and then of course you're following Hunt Athelar and his own issues and then their developing relationship. I thought that this was wonderful. I thought that this was a fantasy that you could really sink your teeth into. I enjoyed taking my time and tabbing it up and really allowing myself to get involved in the world and the characters and I'm so excited to be continuing in the story and there was a shower scene in here y'all that was the sexiest thing I've ever read and it had nothing to do with sex. It was just so steamy and intimate and perfect and it just like made my chest ache. It was so beautiful. So love this immensely and I'm definitely planning on continuing in 2023. Number nine on this list, sitting at a 4.49 with just over 49,000 ratings is God's Grave by Jay Kristoff. This is the second book in his Nevernight trilogy, which follows our assassin Mia Corbeer. When she was just 10 years old, she watched her father hung for treason and her mother and baby brother were taken away and she was meant to be killed, but she escaped. And so she went, she left on the street and she was kind of taken in by a former assassin type character and he was kind of training her and she was eventually sent to the Red Keep where she learned officially how to be an assassin. And so you're following her journeys in Nevernight and God's Grave is a continuation of that. I loved God's Grave immensely. I gave this five stars. It was fantastic. I love Jay Kristoff's humor. It is so dark and dry and it is just my type of humor. So I really enjoyed his writing. There are also some pretty wonderful aspects in here like Mr. Kindly who is a shadow cat that is with Mia at all times because she can kind of manipulate shadows. And so Mr. Kindly is there and eats her fear and of course he's a very snarky animal as well. You also have Bastard the Horse. I don't remember if he is 
in this one or not, but he is definitely in number one. And even though he is not a talking animal character, he is literally just a horse. The snark from this horse is amazing. Bastard is a fantastic character. I loved him so much. I do have plans to continue and finish this trilogy in 2023 and I'm nervous about it, but this is probably one of the best sequels I've ever read. It blew me away. There were like two or three twists at the end of this book that had my jaw on the floor. I couldn't believe it. So I'm excited to see where this goes. Then the next book, it's technically tied with God's Grave. It's also at a 4.47. It has 62,000 ratings and it's a pretty recent release. Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. You will have probably heard me talk about this a lot on my channel recently because I did just read it in the month of November. This follows our main character Tova Sullivan and she's currently on her own living a fairly lonely life. 30 years prior to the start of this novel her son who was 18 at the time mysteriously disappeared off of a boat in the Puget Sound and nobody ever knew what happened to him. The police think he committed suicide. Tova does not but she was never able to prove that. She was never able to get closure for her son and now recently her husband of like 50 plus years has passed away of cancer so she's really just on her own and in order to fill her time she works overnight at the local aquarium doing janitorial work and during her time as a janitor at the aquarium she starts to develop a friendship and a bond with Marcellus who is a giant Pacific octopus and you actually get Marcellus's perspective in here which is absolutely fantastic. He is an amazing character, so snarky and observant and I just loved him immensely. I really wish you got more of his character in here. I really thought that this book was going to be solely focused on Tova and Marcellus but Marcellus was more just a side character and you're really following Tova and her connection with another character in here named Cam, who is probably the second main character. But overall, this was so touching and heartwarming, and it's really what you were expecting going into this story. And I'm keeping my eye on Shelby Van Pelt in the future because I really enjoyed this. And I would love to see if she could do more stories in the future with more animal perspectives. I thought that was really great. So I like that I'm seeing this in one of my top 10 books that I've ever read, considering it's such a new release and it's so highly up there. Now, of course, it definitely has far fewer ratings than like the Sarah J. Mal books or the Kristen Hanna book or the Six of Crows duology, you know, it still has some catching up to do and the more ratings it gets, the farther it might fall. But for right now, I think it's well deserved on this place in my top 10. So as I was scrolling further down this list, I realized that there are actually three other books that have a 4.47 rating that I want to go ahead and mention here as well because they are technically all tied even though some of them probably deserve to be higher up there just because of the amount of ratings that they have. For example, Miss Born the Final Empire by Brendan Sanderson. This is a huge high epic fantasy series that you probably hear relentlessly in the online bookish community. This definitely has a 4.47 and over 500,000 ratings so it is definitely popular. I don't love this series the same way that everybody else loves a series but I do need to continue the first era in the Mistborn trilogy and finish it out. It is definitely intricate. It can certainly be tedious. Like I said I don't love it as much as everybody else does but definitely willing to continue and I'm not at all surprised to see it up here at 4.47. Also at 4.47 with just under 50,000 ratings is Obsidio by J. Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. This is the third and final book in the Illuminae Files trilogy. The Illuminae Files trilogy is probably one of the best reading experiences that I've ever had. They are epic sci-fi space operas and they are chunky but they are entirely mixed media so you were seeing text messages and memos and all kinds of things going on throughout this which makes it fun and fast-paced. I've heard the audiobooks have not only full casts but sound effects too so it kind of can add to the reading experience. I just read these physically but that was still completely amazing. Each of these books is following a different set of characters but in this book they actually all kind of converge and connect. I'm actually kind of surprised that this one is up there in the top of the list and not the actual Illuminae Files the first book because that seems to be the one that everybody talks about the most but this is up there and I really liked it. In the very first book you have like a space war, you have kind of a plague outbreak, you have a rogue AI system, you have a love story, you have just a little bit of everything and I cannot recommend this series enough. It is so much fun. I think everybody can get something out of this series. This is what introduced me to Jay Kristoff overall and he is now one of my favorite authors of all time so cannot recommend this enough. And then the final book that I have on here at a 4.47 with over 2 million ratings is The Help by Katherine Stockett which is a historical fiction that is set in 1960s Mississippi which is something that I found really interesting about the stories because I live in Mississippi and so it was interesting to read a historical book set very close to where I live now. This follows three perspectives. It follows 22 year old Skeeter who has just returned home after graduating from Old Miss. She may have a degree but it's 1962 and her mother will not be happy till Skeeter has a ring on her finger. Skeeter would normally find solace with her beloved maid Constantine, the woman who raised her but Constantine has disappeared and no one will tell Skeeter where she has gone. 
Abilene is a black maid, a wise regal woman raising her 17th white child. Something has shifted inside her after the loss of her own son who died while his bosses looked the other way. She is devoted to the little girl she looks after, though she knows both their hearts may be broken. Minnie, Abilene's friend, best friend, is short, fat, and perhaps the sassiest woman in Mississippi. She can cook like nobody's business, but she can't mind her tongue, so she's lost yet another job. Minnie finally finds a position working for someone too new to town to know her reputation, but her new boss has secrets of her own. Seemingly as different from one another as can be, these women will nonetheless come together for a clandestine project that will put them all at risk and why because they are suffocating within the lines that define their own town and their times and sometimes lines are made to be crossed so i remember really enjoying the story overall skeeter is a white woman who is out to kind of tell the story of the help who in this time in mississippi was basically predominantly or completely black and i just really enjoyed the characters in this story overall i thought that this was such an important read i haven't actually watched the adaptation but i would like to someday because i did really enjoy this and so so this is another one that I'm not really surprised to see up there, especially with how many ratings overall this has. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are the top books that I've ever read according to Goodreads. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books and if you agree that they should be on my top 10 or top 10 and above list. Or please let me know some of the top books that you have read according to Goodreads. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.